Hello, this is Mike Houtsager, the producer of the Phil Schneider CD, and I have with me today Mr. Al Bielik. Uh I asked Mr. Al Bielik to come on and say a few words about his experience and his relationship with Phil Schneider. He knew him very well, and in fact he knew him several years prior to his death in 1996, yes. I believe it was. So I asked him to come on and just share with us, share with you, uh, perhaps some of the private conversations that he had with Phil uh, because there were many times they spent I guess at a conference a hotel room together they had a lot of conversations together they were close personal friends all the way up toward the end and with that Al thanks for being here today oh, thank you hopefully I can contribute something to the what is sometimes called the mystery of Phil Schneider I don't think his life as such was any mystery but prior to the point when he went public perhaps it was because he worked for the government in one capacity or another for many years uh, he was both of the skunk works and what was called the skunk works in Burbank, California he was at Edwards Air Force Base he worked all over the country and eventually all over the world on underground bases told me many stories regarding those of course his involvement with the Dulce in wars as they were sometimes called against the aliens he was one of the very few survivors and the one which was so disastrous all of these things of course I did not know about him in fact never heard of him until sometime in early 93 as I remember when I was at a conference doing a lecture course in the Philadelphia Experiment in Seattle he showed up introduced himself and says I would like to talk with you he says my father Oscar Schneider was part of the Philadelphia experiment well of course my ears perked up <laughs> and over the course of time he told me some things about his father at that point I believe his father was still alive it was shortly after I met him that his father died of cancer but he had his father had been basically a captain in the United States Navy Medical Corps and was the chief medical officer for the Philadelphia experiment and other things afterwards. <coughs> Phil now, didn't his father, that's Oscar Schneider, tell him, Phil, this information just before he died? Or, or yes. Uh, he knew that he was involved in the Philadelphia experiment. That was an open discussion uh, well before he died. Well before. Okay. But what was not open discussion until two weeks pre prior to his death, when he, uh, Oscar, knew he was dying of cancer and was, I guess, irreversible at that point, he called Phil into his bedside and uh, says, Phil, I want you to know the my real history. He says, I've always told you I was born in the U.S. of Jewish parentage and such. He says, that's not true. He says, I was born in Germany many years ago. Uh, the exact date I don't recall. But during the period when Hitler was in power, it was when he grew, Oscar grew up, he was a master machinist, and I'm quoting what Phil told me, his father was a master machinist at the age of 14, which was quite an accomplishment in Germany then, and eventually enlisted in the Navy and became a captain, a captain of a U-boat. According to what I was told, Oscar Schneider had something like 68 successful kills, that is sinking English or French shipping during the early part of World War II, which in the United States was not involved until after December 7, 41. And he was captured at some point along the line by the French. He was taken in custody. He was held there in France and leaked, I think he said uh, late 39, early 40. Sometime in that period, I'm not quite sure of the dates, but it was in that period around the early 1940. And some negotiations took place. And at some point, <coughs> the Third Army of the United States was involved when now, of course, we had some troops over there. He was turned over to the American troops and, and brought back to the United States <coughs> and suddenly given the same rank in the United States Navy as he'd had in the German Navy, that of a captain. And, of course, he was a medical officer. Now, Phil asked the same question I did. If he was a U-boat captain and he comes to the United States Navy, how could he suddenly become a medical officer? Well, another statement you said, Al, I see is odd. Did he tell his son that he was Jewish? 
prior to the true story. He was not Jewish. So Phil thought he was Jewish? Yes. But but he, he was, was really not. German. He was really German. Okay, so that was the cover. Right. He was actually born about 1905, if I remember correctly. And uh, the official Navy record, which I have seen, says that he was born in 1905 in some little town called Cisco, California. Went through University of Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley for his pre-med. This is Phil? But this is for Oscar Schneider. Oscar. This is the official version I'm talking about for the Navy, which I have a copy of somewhere. And when he finished his uh, pre-med, he went to Harvard for his medical, his internship, and then joined the Navy and worked his way up through the ranks as a medical officer. That's the official version. The unofficial version and the facts are quite different. Now, how Phil Schneider, well, Phil Schneider, of course, had no choice but to accept the word of his father, but how Phil Schneider thought about this, I don't really know, except he questioned it just as much as I did. How could a man who had been in the German Navy for a number of years as a captain going around as a U-boat captain sinking Allied shipping suddenly become a medical doctor? It had to be a cover, which the Navy made up the whole story of his original being born in the U.S. and going to all the medical schools here. Well, well do you think, Gal, that his br being brought over here to the United States was part of Operation Paperclip? No, oh, it was long before Paperclip. Paperclip was 1946. Okay. He was brought over to the United States in late, and sometime in, I believe, late 41. And <coughs> well, did, did he say why he was brought over or why he came over? To become part of the Philadelphia Experiment was the information I have and the information which I believe Phil had. He was put into that immediately. Mm. Now one has to ask the question, why? Having read some of the private papers of Oscar Schneider, all I can say is for an MD to run off the mathematical equations I have seen and references to time travel and equations for time travel, I knew the reason why the United States government wanted him. He apparently was involved somewhere, and I have to say this as an assumption. Mm -hmm. He was apparently involved somewhere in the background of the German research on time travel and time research because they had a program going also, as we did. And our program, of course, was heavily concealed under very high security starting in 1936. But the Germans allegedly had a successful time travel system functioning before World War II was over. And it would appear that Oscar Schneider had knowledge of this, and because of his knowledge of this, was assigned to our project, namely the Philadelphia Experiment. Now, the Philadelphia Experiment was not truly a case for time travel. It was a case for using manipulations of time in the time field to create invisibility, but there was a relationship. That's my uh, data, my assumption, and what I have been able to put together on why they wanted Oscar Schneider in the U.S. Because otherwise, why would you take a naval commander from Germany who had sunk all kinds of ships, including maybe your own? At this point, I don't believe he had sunk him in a, a U.S. ship, but Allied shipping, and suddenly put him in the United States Navy at the same rank he had held in the German Navy? Well, did Oscar ever share that with Phil as far as the reasoning that he was brought over? I don't know whether he really did or not. I discussed this with mm -hmm. Phil quite a lot, mm -hmm. and Phil did not give me all of the background that he knew about his father except this aspect. There might have been a connection between Oscar Schneider coming to the United States and my father, my real father, Ed, uh, as Edward Cameron. My father was Alexander Duncan Cameron Sr., who was involved in uh, government intelligence from the time he left the Navy in 1929 through the period of 46 when he was heavily involved in Operation Paperclip. Mm -hmm. He brought a lot of German scientists into the U.S., I certainly don't know who they all were. Could he possibly have had a connection with mm -hmm. Oscar Schneider? So I think it's possible. Okay, so in your conversations with Phil, did he say anything else about this? You know, his dad and the Philadelphia experiment specifically to you? Did he say the only other things that were came out specifically was that Phil's father and my father were very close friends. Okay. And they used to go on fishing trips together out of Sarasota, Florida. This was, of course, after the war was over. But <clears throat> I, just, I can make an assumption here without really knowing the facts that they might have known each other before Oscar Schneider came to the U.S. That is a possibility. Okay. 
So, so that was the link, I guess. That was the reason why Phil Schneider came to you in the first place. He came to me in the first place because he knew that I was involved in the Philadelphia experiment. He knew his father was involved. And he in wanted it. to close. And the he wanted to tell me about it okay. and discuss various things. So, from that point, did you two become close friends? Yes, we did. Immediately. We became uh, casual friends at first, mm -hmm. and as time went on, I kept talking with him. I says, Phil, with what you know about various things in the background, plus uh, the Philadelphia Experiment, and what you say you had been involved with in building underground bases, and uh, traveling in the underground, and building the underground tube transportation system, why aren't you out talking about this publicly? He says, you're not involved in the, in the Navy anymore. You're not in the service. You're not working for the government. So he was, was he retired at the time? He was retired. He actually was retired in the sense that he retired himself. He was not formally retired. He walked out on the government. He walked out on the NATO position. Mm -hmm. And the reasons for that he gave me is very specifically. And uh, in terms of the background of Phil, this might prove very interesting. Phil, in his own way, worked his way up through the ranks as a geologist and became involved with building underground bases and the tug, tube system for the underground transportation system and eventually graduated into a NATO position. It was all over the world and he knew how many underground bases were built in the U.S. as well as worldwide. He used to tell me 131 in the U.S. and about 1,400 worldwide mm -hmm. of the type we described, which was one to three miles underground, uh, anywhere from uh, one half to three cubic miles of earth were removed by nuclear detonation and to create this huge cavern because earth is uh, the rock is porous and if you choose the right earth uh, materials, the right rock material, which he was an expert at, you had to use certain types of rock material to build the underground base or you just forgot it. It had to be certain layered rocks, certain structures, which I'm not familiar with, but he was. And you build these underground bases. They were all over the world. They've been built by other nations also. And part of this led into his NATO operations, but the thing where he left was most interesting. He was online for, and I said two and a half, three years retirement for NATO, formal retirement, with uh, his salary at that time in NATO had gone up to something like half a million bucks a year. Hmm. This is a salary. Wow. And his retirement was slated to be one million per year retirement. He was an extremely important person at a very high level, had high level clearances. But he said what changed his mind and he decided to walk out on everything was the fact that he was invited to attend some UN meetings, the very classified ones, which were not held in New York at the UN terminal and the UN buildings, but in a deep underground military base. And they said there was a facility which had all of the layout exactly like they have in the UN headquarters in New York, underground in this base, and never told me where it was. But there was an extra row of chairs, or ta a ring table and a row of chairs, above the rest, which was not ex extant in the usual settings for the UN, for the uh, meetings. Everybody would go in there, including the spectators were there himself and some other uh, people. Everybody would sit down and be waiting, and then the final group came in, would sit at this upper, upper tier of chairs. There were all tall grays extraterrestrials, seven-footers. Like the ones he shot in Dulce? I don't know if he ever shot a seven-footer. Uh, he didn't tell me particularly whether it was a seven-footer or not, but he said the ones that came in on the UN meeting were the seven-footers, yeah. and they dictated policy to the United Nations. He attended not one, but two meetings of this type, and he says after the second meeting, he says, I am working for the wrong people. Had a conference that day with some of his NATO friends in the NATO uh, the Department of Geology, I believe is what he called it. There's a whole group of about 40 of them. They all decided they wanted no more of any part of it. They walked out on retirement, salaries, everything. All 40 walked out the same day and wiped out the NATO's Department of Geology. Hmm. And he retired. He went back to Portland, Oregon. He was living alone in his own apartment. He had an ex-wife and a daughter, about eight years old, I met at that time. She's a little older than that now. And sort of uh, ruminated within himself, talked occasionally before one group in Oregon, which was the Western Bigfoot Society. I spoke of him talking before that, and there is one article published on the net about it. He used to talk about some of the things he knew at this Bigfoot Society group, but he never went totally public. This was a private group. It was not a really public group. I kept insisting. 
with what you know, Phil, you should go public with this. I said, it's in the interest of the public. They should know some of these things. I said, I'm not telling you you should say everything you know, but certainly about the underground bases and operations and so forth. So I finally got him out on the lecture circuit after we finally talked about this quite a bit. The first attempt at a lecture, which was successful so far as the lecture was concerned, but uh, in terms of videotaping, it was a failure, and that was on 7th of May, 1995, in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Was that his first lecture? That was the first one public of this nature. Okay. It's not the first lecture he ever did. Yeah, because he mentions that he did like 30 or 40 lectures. He did a total that year of about 30 or 40. He made some prior to that, and again with the Bigfoot Society and the small groups in the Portland area. So this was in Las Vegas on 7th of May. The next day we were slated, the 8th of May, to talk so uh, up in the uh, Cody Lane area of Idaho. So w was it 94 that he decided to go public? It was uh, early 95. I kept twisting. It was early 95. I okay. kept twisting his arm, and he finally decided, all right, we'll try it. Yeah. The first one that was recorded successfully was the one outside of Coeur Lane. I think it was Post Falls, Idaho. Mm -hmm. That was on the 8th of May. Then there was the August one in Denver at the uh, uh, Dean Stonier's conference, Global Sciences, and he did a workshop for about two hours. September, the preparedness show in Seattle. November, another preparedness show in uh, not Seattle, it was elsewhere. I think Denver. And uh, that was the last of the public series which were recorded. In between this, of course, he had many other lectures. He knew a great deal about the uh, Kobe, Japan uh, earthquake, mm -hmm. which is what it was formally called. Oh, and many others, too. Yeah, he but he knew a great deal about those. He knew a great deal about the earth faults. He, excuse me, he used to tell me about them. The earth falls? Earth falls all over the U.S. He knew all about them. Faults, right. yeah, the fault mm -hmm. lines. And the Denver was relatively safe, but he said if you go west into some of these so-called secluded areas for survival, he says they've got fault lines running right through them. He says the first ridge of the Rock, Great Rocky Mountains, as an example, is loaded with fault lines. He says you don't want to be there. He says you go further west on the second ridge. He says you're okay. He knew the whole of the geologic layouts and where the problems were and such. But he was invited to go to Japan to speak over there. The State Department refused to let him go. They says you're not going. He says, we know you have a passport, but you're not going to Japan. Hmm. We, will not, we will not allow it. Oh, because he wanted to talk about the Kobe earthquake. He wanted to talk he? about the Kobe earthquake and a few other things. And they wanted to find out, didn't they? And they wanted to find out the facts of what he might know. So they arranged that. Since he's now long gone, it doesn't make any difference. He arranged it very neatly. The Japanese says, we'll pick you up out of Vancouver, B.C. He says, we'll fly our own jet over. He says, you drive up. He says, you can drive across the border with no problem. Of course you can, unless there was a strict order at the border that he's not to go, which there wasn't. He could just, as a tourist, drive across the border into Canada on a driver's license. He didn't have to show a passport. So we did that. And you met them at a the particular airport in Vancouver area, and they flew him over to Japan in their private jet. He was there three days lecturing on the Kobe earthquake and who knows what else. When you say they, who were the they? They were the top executives of major Japanese corporations. Mm -hmm. Mitsubishi is one example. I remember he mentioned Mitsubishi and some of the others. I don't remember all the names. So they must have given him quite a bit of credibility. Well, they did give him a great deal of credibility. W was there any uh, retribution that the Japanese enacted as a result? No, there was no uh, retribution on the Japanese or by the Japanese. By the course. Japanese, yeah. I no. Mean, because obviously what, what Phil's saying is that we blew off an atomic bomb that caused the earthquake, right? That's exactly correct. Now, there was a, t a tactical nuke in the harbor, which was planted by, yeah. as he said, Navy SEALs. And it, it was followed a long argument between the United States government and Japan over the fact that Japan was the world's leader in uh, synthetic intelligence computer technology. And, and, all of it centered, and all of it centered in Kobe. Right. So what happened with the executives? Uh, that's an unknown, <laughs> to me anyway. To, yeah. Uh, Kobe was leveled, and the, particularly the building which contained most of the research for this was leveled. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me that 70% of the Japanese scientists working on synthetic intelligence computer systems were living in Kobe and were working on that project there, and it was leveled. And that put them out of business, and the U.S. government uh, 
probably uh, whatever elements in the government. It can't unaccuse the whole government. It's some certain sections oh, sure. within it. Sure. Uh, probably felt satisfied. There was no repercussions that I know of. But at the same time, <coughs> those executives learned what they, uh, what Phil had to say regarding the facts of what happened. And what may have happened after that, I have no idea. Okay. And, and about what day again was this? What was the date when he was actually flown to Japan? Was it 94 or 95? It was in 95, uh, after it had gone public. And I would say it was in the fall months, but I'm not sure of the dates. Okay. Because Phil died, uh, murder by suicide, if you will, uh, on or about the 10th of February of 1996. Right. It was just before he was going to go to the Global Sciences Congress in Florida, that winter Congress. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back before we get into his death. Right. Uh, you... you Again, had a lot of um, contact with Phil, and, and didn't you spend? We spent a lot of time with him, going around uh, lecturing, particularly that period when we were in uh, Cody Lane in the hotel there, sponsored by a woman who is now dead. She brought a lot of people in, lecturing right. all over. But didn't you share a hotel room with yeah, him? Yeah, share a room with him. Did, did he? Did he? Share any other information yes, he did. with you besides what we are going to see on the CD on the videotapes. He mentioned Area 51 mm -hmm. and uh, a very interesting incident that occurred out there. He had business during the time he was working for the government to go out to Area 51 periodically and see some particular officer in the, I think he said the Air Force, I'm not positive now, a uh, rather high rank on business related to what he was doing. And in this one particular day, he said when you went out there, you went in, and uh, you went into the outer office, and a Marine uh, <coughs> guard there says, uh, <coughs> Mr. So-and-so is not ready to see you right now. Please have a seat in this office. Oh, and by the way, um, just keep your eyes straight ahead. Don't look from side to side, and when he's ready, he'll call you. Because it's all out to Phil, and he's going to have other ideas. What is it they don't want me to see? So he let his eyes wander, and he saw a window, uh, probably one of those slanting windows, where he could see through partially. It was a dark colored glass. He could see through partially and see that there was somebody behind that glass. Eventually he got to uh, talk with the person he was to meet and talk with, uh, what his business was and so on, and took care of that. And then he asked the guy, he says, uh, there's a uh, smoke glass window out there on the other side of your office. Uh, what's this all about? He said, oh, that's one of our guests. He said, one of your guests? What do you mean? He says, one of the guests of the government. Said, what do you mean, guests of the government? He says, oh, that's one of the aliens we keep around. Aliens? Yes. Uh, what do you mean? He says, well, we have a few guests, you know, from the, the UFOs that have come down and so forth. He says, we've got a reptilian in there. He says, we've had him here for months. We've been trying to get him to talk. We can't. He said he won't talk with anyone. Mm -hmm. So Phil looks at the officer and he says, why don't you let me try? The guy looks at Phil and says, you? He says, what makes you think he'll talk with you? He says, I don't know. Why don't you give it a try? He says, well, everybody else has failed. Why not? Mm -hmm. So he was prepared for this. He said, you, this is a special room. It's got special atmospheric mixture for him and a temperature of 123 degrees F. You have to go in in a suit, an air-conditioned suit and so forth. Yeah. And you have microphones and speaker and all of the appropriate prayer. And uh, You're saying the reptilians can't live in this atmosphere? Oh, they can. But this guy was being kept in the atmosphere of what was more normal to what he was experiencing, would normally experience. They kept him in an atmosphere which was essentially the same as his home atmosphere. And where was his home? No, it was not mentioned to me. Okay. <clears throat> so Phil went in there, and he said uh, he was in there 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and this guy, I say guy, I assume it was a male, uh, started coming out with a bunch of pips and squeaks and high-pitched sounds. Now, being that this creature was about six foot tall, one would expect a lower voice. But if you have some rare gas mixtures, such as argon, helium, whatever, it's common knowledge, of course, if you put a human in a helium, a high helium mixture. Yeah, they sound funny. They sound funny. Their voice right. goes up in frequency because the, the propagation rate to the gas is a much higher rate than normal air. So is that the problem? That was apparent part of the problem. Mm -hmm. So eventually Phil did get to talk with this creature, 
and they exchanged some thoughts and ideas. As he was trying to speak in English, but it didn't come out very well. Because of the gas. And the because reason. of the gas and so forth. Perhaps he didn't know the language that well. I do not know the reasons. So but eventually talked with him. Okay, so Phil actually got them to change the gas? I don't know whether they did that or not. Okay. But in any case, Phil reported back to the officer later. He says, yeah, I got this guy to talk and such and such and such. Well, at the time when Phil admitted this to me, I asked him, I said, what did the guy tell you? What did he talk about? He says, I don't feel comfortable about talking about that at this time. Hmm. He never did tell me. But he got a permanent assignment for three months there as the official interpreter for this alien. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody else could talk with him, but except he would, this guy would talk with Phil. Wow. So what information came out of that? Who knows? It's but the government, bad. the bad government was trying to, of course, to interrogate all of these captured aliens that were still alive, mm -hmm. and find out uh, where they're from, what they were doing here, and whatever they could get out of them. And apparently, it was a fairly successful program, because I know one other person who was on the lecture circuit for some years, uh, Dean Stoney, is up in Denver, who was lecturing about the aliens and admitted openly that he spent seven years in the Pentagon on special projects related to UFOs. I happened to wander in on this lecture was going because he had the door open and I looked on the podium, he had notes on the podium, this is a friend of mine, I'm not talking about Phil, I'm talking about somebody else later, mm -hmm. and all alien text. I looked at this alien text and I says to uh, my friend, uh, I didn't know you could read this stuff. He looked at me and says, what do you think I did for seven years in the Pentagon? And I said, oh, <laughs> who is this? Uh, I don't know if I should mention his name. I know who he is and all that, but he is now out of the circuit. But was I he a speaker? He was the speaker. He was the speaker. Well, that would be public information. Basically, yeah. Uh, was a, he was the nephew of a famous admiral who went to the South Pole back in 1947. Admiral Byrd. This was mm -hmm. Admiral Byrd's nephew. His name at the moment escapes me, but it can be traced. Okay. But in any case, I found that curious because here was more evidence of alien language text, mm -hmm. and there has been a great deal of communication with aliens by certain elements of our government, the secret government. Right. And Phil was involved with this for some three months. Well, did, did Phil know who this quote-unquote secret government is? Did he know the people? Because he talks about his security clearance. Yes. I, I forget the name of it, the, something three, that he had this very high-level security clearance. You know, this got into an interesting point of contention later, not with Phil and between Phil and myself. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a uh, peculiar clearance, and it was related to one of the gemstones. They had a Ryan gem, or uh, at a gemstone level of clearance. There were several levels of gemstones and several numbers, and he had one of these clearances uh, plus some other level which came out of the Pentagon. And many years after this, after Phil was dead and gone, I was on the one and only time on the program as a talk. Uh, he was the host was uh, the former director of the FBI in Los Angeles, who had me on his talk show, and we got talking about Phil and his level of clearance. Was that Gunderson? Gunderson, Ted Gunderson, okay. correct. And I mentioned the level of clearance, and one of Ted's friends calls in and talks on the show, introduces himself, and says, I am a, I don't know if he said former not NSA employee or still was NSA, but he says, quote, there's no such level of clearance. I got into quite an argument with this guy, and uh, finally, I was cut off the air, quite literally, just chopped off. Hmm. I talked with Phil much later, years later, about this. Why was I cut off the air at that time? He says, he says I had nothing to do with that. He says, well, who did? And he says, I had orders from the program head that runs the, st runs the program for the station that I was to be cut off of the air. The program is going to cut off the air. Who, Ted, said that? Yes, he said that person to me. To me. Wow. So here you were. You were on the air. You're describing Phil's level of security clearance, clearance right. by name. Right. And Ted Gunterson, who was the host, told you later he had to cut you off the air. Right. He oh. says, it was not my doing. He said, I had orders to cut you off. Oh. That's so it's very interesting because... Well, he's the one, actually, who's involved in that lawsuit with Art Bell right now. Ted Gunnarsson? Yeah. I didn't know Ted Gunnarsson was involved in a lawsuit with him. Yeah, he's, he's the one. 
I, I know we're sort of veering off a little yeah. bit, but that's... Uh, I know somebody else was in a lawsuit with Art Bell for uh, two years, and finally that that broke off, and that's the guy who was the founder of uh, Reverse Speech, so-called. Yeah, David... Uh, Oates. Uh, David Oates. No, it, just let all of you guys know, it was... Uh, there was this, on the radio, this insinuation on Gunterson's program that Art Bell was... Um, uh, child molester, a pedophile, pedophile, right? I remember those charges, but I never. That knew was who on his radio program. I never knew who made those charges. I did not know that Ted Gunnarsson had made them. Well, in reality, he didn't. He did not. He did not make those. But somehow, somehow, Art Bell thought he did, or was told that there's a did. mystery behind all. Yes, that. there is some mystery involved yeah. in this whole thing. Yeah. It became quite a problem with uh, Art Bell. He went off the air twice because yeah. he's now back on but back on. it was basically because of family problems involving his son well, it's, it's, uh, I just watched this tape so it's an interesting story yeah. but let's get back to Phil Schneider right. um, and, and the reason why people are listening to this is they want to get the rest of the story Yes. so, so what else did he share with you well, he mentioned the fact that he had been in Europe and in Russia mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> Though he claims he never rode on these underground railroad systems, he helped build them. And it says, among other things that he was aware of, was the huge pile of UFOs, of wrecked ones, that we had, and that we were shooting down UFOs at the rate of approximately seven a month. And, uh, did he see these piles of UFOs? Yes, he did, personally. And where were they? He didn't specifically state where in the U.S., other than there was more than one. There were several piles of them. But he said while he was in Russia on NATO business, he looked into the matter over there, and he said they had football fields. He said fields full of junk UFOs have covered two football fields. He said they were shooting them down at the rate of about one a day. And I said, well, what about the occupants? He says, I don't know what happened to any of the occupants. But he said the orders have been out for quite some time. This would mean prior to '95 that anyone who comes in to the earth closer than, as I was told, a 250 mile periphery above the surface of the earth, a 250 mile zone, safe zone for us, any closer than 250 miles above the surface of the earth, they'd be shot down no matter who they were, friend or foe. They had to have clearance to come in closer, mm -hmm. no matter who they were. Well, see, I would say, I'm gonna, the, the listener would say, these guys, these UFOs, these extraterrestrials had the capability to do space travel couldn't they counter our defensive measures? Not what we have now. now we have particle beam weapon systems a la Tesla but of course vastly beyond what even Tesla dreamed of in terms of power. They now are so powerful that much of the research was done at Montauk Point in conjunction with the Montauk Project but quite aside from that we have them all over the planet now. There's some 36 major high-powered ones, from what I understand. And the power level is now to the point with one of the newer ones, which is a twin beam, particle beam, <coughs> which is transmitted as a scalar uh, transmission system. And if you know anything about scalar theory, which maybe some of you listeners will, if you cross two scalar beams, so they cross each other, you manifest a strict electromagnetic beam with all of its manifestations at that crossover point. So what they do is they aim two of these uh, particle beams in the scalar mode out into space wherever they want to. And when they want it to, let's say, produce a physical manifestation such as converging on a UFO and blowing it out of the sky, they will focus it that way. Now, it will take a bit of power to do this. Uh, the power now is up into the terawatts region. Uh, it has gone from megawatts to gigawatts, and it's now up to terawatts. And the last piece of information I had on this was that we have been using the moons of Jupiter for a shooting gallery for practice when the particle beam, the newest one from Earth, the uh, tunnel for these have to be optically aligned, laser aligned, and so forth. 300 miles long? Deep, you mean? No, 300 miles long for the system, well under the Earth, in the mm -hmm. middle of the U.S. somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, of course, now how they reflect the energy out and how they focus it, I do not know. But you think that's but what they're using to get That is what they're using well. to blow, bore a hole or blow a hole through one of the moons of Jupiter 25 miles in diameter from Earth. 
I think that will take care of any UFO that's out there, including in the Jupiter orbit. Well, of course, you know, half the people listening to this are going to believe you, and the other and half, the other half will not. <laughs> I'm sorry I cannot give my sources of information on that, but I do have some rather good sources. Yeah. Okay. What, what else did Phil tell you that was interesting in those private moments? Well, he showed me, of course, his scars, uh, which are obvious. They're on the video. They're on the video. Right. There's nothing unusual about that. But uh, he told me about one of his encounters in the underground when we were uh, doing a bore for preparation to build an underground base. They said the typical procedure was they bored a large diameter hole, large enough to run a captain's chair down through. It was about six feet or so in diameter. And uh, it could be earth boring, it could be laser, it could be whatever. But they bore this hole down, it says anywhere from one to three miles. The goal typically was between one and three miles, no less than one mile. But his job was when they had it down to the depth they wanted, he would go down on the captain's chair, literally physically down in the borehole, and examine the rock structure at the bottom to see if it was a kind of rock structure that would uh, be possible to use to create by blasting their underground base. He says more than once it happened that as they were boring, they hit an open area, an underground cavern system. And he was dropped down the first one of these, he, that where it happened that way, he was told get on the chair and go down and find out what's down there. Well, he took lighting with him. He said he didn't know what to expect. Is this the Dulce Wars you're going to talk about? No, this is before the Dulce oh, Wars. So nothing there's another to, one. This has nothing to do with Dulce Wars. Uh -huh. This is in a standard procedure of building the underground bases. Wouldn't it get hot? I mean, I could imagine if you're being lowered down. No, well, this miles. is another great misconception. Hmm. Uh, I've done a lot of spelunking in my life, and uh, this is one of the strange things they tell you. In all of the natural caves and natural cavern systems, they are the same temperature the world over, averaging around 52 degrees Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. night or day, summer or winter. They vary maybe plus or minus two degrees from that but they hold right around 52, and regardless of the depth, they're still 52 degrees. Now you say, well, what about volcanoes? They have a, a special structure, and apparently the volcanoes, of course, they're hot, you have molten rock, but there's no truly accurate theory to explain why you have volcanoes with all this molten lava, which is assumed to come from the center of the earth, it does not. Why we have volcanoes is still something of an unexplained mystery, and even Phil couldn't come up with an answer on that one. But he went down on this one case on the chair. So this was before the Dulce Wars? This is before the Dulce okay. Wars. Good. He got down to the chair and uh, got down to the left, get out of the chair, and was wandering around in a very dimly, dim cavern system, very foul air, uh, apparently sort of breathable, but very foul air. And with his lighting, he'd look around there, and he wandered. He thought he saw a shadow or something moving. He wandered around one of the corners of this cavern system, just face to face with an alien. And he said he looked at it. It looked at him. As, if I remember correctly, he described it as a reptilian. But he says it went for something on his chest, it had some kind of a plaque or thing on his chest. And he describes this story on yeah. On the, on the and but he says he pulled out his uh, nine millimeter. Ruger that he had in his pocket. Yeah. He wasn't supposed to have in the suit, but he had a hunch to take the gun with him that day, and he did, and he shot this thing dead before he got him. Yeah. He said this happened more than once. Well, I thought this was the Dulce Wars you're talking about, because no. he said that 60 or so um, soldiers actually got killed in that exchange. In the exchange in the Dulce Wars and the Dulce Tunnel, but this was a totally separate phenomena. See, when he was talking about exploring, uh, this is when I say private conversations. Okay. He was exploring these caverns when they hit them. When he went back up finally and told them what happened, uh, he said he got the impression that they knew all about it. And he says eventually he learned the government knew where these underground caverns were and that they were inhabited. So how is that experience different from what the Dulce Wars were? The Dulce Wars was going into a base they already knew, already had. It was originally a government base. It was turned over to the aliens. And... They took it over completely and eventually kicked out the scientists, wanted to run it entirely on their own. The government wanted it back, and this was in New Mexico, of course, and my understanding of the history of it, it was originally built as a storage depot for nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. But the governor of New Mexico at that time says, you're not dumping that nuclear waste here in an underground facility in New Mexico. You're not going to use it for that, even though it's already been built for that purpose. Eventually, it was adopted for the 
uh, I guess what one would say, the underground labs and experimentation, which took place at Delsey. The aliens were invited in, they more or less took it over, and then eventually totally took it over. But the attempt to get it back from the aliens, so some 66 people went in fully armed, or they thought fully armed, and only four or five total came out. Phil was one of those that came out alive, all injured, had to be carried out by uh, Marines they brought in just to carry them out, and even the Marines were hit. And he recovered slowly. He had severe burn marks. He had a hole in his chest and uh, other burns. So, and that, so, so that's a different experience. Totally separate from what he the told. one he talks about with the alien who yes, shot you know, him. Yes, single one, one on one, where he shot. So this he was not one on one. This was a known number of aliens at the other end of the tunnel, right. uh, costing 66 people, including most military, heavily armed, or they assumed they were adequately armed, right. and literally took all of the military out. They had weapon systems we did not have at that time. Yeah. Now, did he ever say he was physically on board a uh, UFO or ET craft? I do not recall that he ever mentioned that, no. Okay. Um, did, was there anything else that was bizarre that he shared with you? Yes, he did. If you get into the period after he left the government, he remained, as he said, quiet for about two years, two and a half years, didn't talk publicly. He took his oaths of secrecy seriously and wouldn't discuss any of what he had done. But then he started talking a little trial pits, you might call it, trial balloons, at the, uh, the club that was there, the Western uh, Bigfoot Club. And I talked with him. Eventually he realized, he said, the public should know some of this. So I kept twisting his arm to go public, and he did. During this whole period, he was visited periodically by various people from his old group and from the government, from intelligence. A, we don't like what you're doing. You shouldn't be taking this public. We'll forgive you everything if you just come back and work for us. And he told you that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he said this went on repeatedly. He says, finally, after his trip to Japan and when he came back, he said some uh, fairly high-level intelligence people came to visit him as an apartment in Oregon and Portland area. Mm -hmm. and dis discussed with him that uh, he says, we want you to know, Mr. Schneider, you have done a great deal of damage to, uh, let's say, the whole infrastructure, a great deal of damage to the New World Order. He says, how much? He says, it's incalculable. He says, you have done major damage to them with your lectures. Uh, but have they really? Has he really? This is what he was told, and this is what he passed on to me. That's a good question. Did they really? Of course, he got the same pitch again. We'll forgive you all of this if you will just come back with us. We really need you. Mm -hmm. He kept telling them no. Well, it's from that point on, apparently, that they started the attempts on his life. Every conceivable form. I think he mentions that there was around 13 or 13 so. 13 before, of course, the 14th ago. Okay, but yeah, they go through the whole thing. He yep. goes through that. Why don't we focus in on, on what really got him? Because you seem to have a pretty good handle on what really got him. No, yeah. okay. Uh, I was given a phone call by his ex-wife a few nights before the February conference was to start in Florida for Global Sciences. Because he was to be a speaker, he was a scheduled speaker there, and he was going to come up to Atlanta from there and do some major videotaping on what he knew. He kept saying. Mm -hmm. I have lots to tell you. I've only scratched about 1% of it. And he says, I want to put it all on record. Oh, it's too bad we don't have that. And it's too bad that he never got to yeah. it. But in any case, that's what he said he would do. And on that night, I believe it was the 10th of February, I got a call from his ex-wife saying Phil was dead. He's been found in his apartment. We think <clears throat> that he had a, uh, had a heart attack and heart failure. And where did he live again? He was in uh, uh, Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And you were in Atlanta, Georgia? Yes. Time, right? Okay. Well, after the conference was over, of course, I flew up there. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> she has to go through his apartment and effects. But the story was that basically, to give the initial part of it, basically, a group that came to visit him regularly, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses group, he spoke to them about once every two weeks. Mm -hmm. He was friendly with them, they were friendly with him. Because he was not a highly religious person. He did believe in God, but he was not 
uh, highly religious in the sense of what persons normally think is highly religious. Really, I, I watched was a video, and you know, of his the the three different videos of him speaking, or four actually, and he seems to be religious. Yes, he had basic religious beliefs. Perhaps God fearing is yes, how I put that it. would be perhaps the right term. But he was not hooked on any specific religion and all of the tenets of that religion. Okay. But these Jehovah's Witnesses people came to visit him, he talked with them and so forth, and this went on on a regular basis. <coughs> now, what, he, what I was told was that on this particular morning, when it was discovered that he was dead, they came to his apartment, saw his car parked outside, rang the doorbell, got no answer. In the past, they always got an answer. And... Uh, I went to the management and said, uh, there's something wrong. Phil's car's here, but he's not answering the door. Mm -hmm. So he says, oh, we get a, we'll get a key and we'll go in and look. So they opened the door and looked, and there is, was his moldering body. It was already decaying. A couple well, of days. Right? A couple of days. It was estimated at that point it was four days. Uh, moldering on the floor in his bedroom, nothing but a pair of shorts, his body half under the bed, and his head and shoulders propped up on a wheelchair. So he was fairly bloated at the time. He was he? bloated at the time. Mm -hmm. but they assumed that he might have been in his wheelchair and fell out, but that was uh, the initial assumption. So, of course, they called the police. They called the uh, funeral home. They took the body in for the usual treatment for preparation for a funeral. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was then that they found out that it uh, was something a little abnormal. There was a rubber tube wrapped around his neck three times and knotted in the back. I mean, right back here. And you had to literally move, remove the bloated folds of flesh to see the tube. Was not, the tubing was not available in view otherwise. Now, theoretically, so, he could have done that to himself, couldn't he? Not hardly, because he had three fingers missing from both hands. He had fingers cut off or blown off from various uh, explosive and other things that had happened. He had severe arthritis. He, could, he had very strong hands and arms but he could not manipulate his fingers correctly. Mm -hmm. So he did not have the ability to tie that rubber hose and knot it. Yeah, he could have wrapped something around his neck and held it this way, but who is going to commit suicide by holding a rubber tube this way? As soon as you relax, the tube lets loose and you breathe again. It was knotted. And of course, the autopsy performed not by the county coroner, but by a local medic brought in by the police department of Portland. I've read the autopsy went through the whole list and I noticed two things. One, they never did a blood test. Two, they never did a urine test. Uh, three, when they went through the uh, descriptions of the various body parts, when they came to the penis, they said nothing unusual or abnormal. Well, that was the red flag right there. As his ex-wife, who gave me a copy of the autopsy report, said, as soon as I read that, it says I knew that either the doctor was in totally incompetent or that wasn't Phil's body. I said, why? Because I didn't know at this point what the, she was referring to and what my friend in uh, <clears throat> Seattle, Washington, he spent a lot of time with because he was preparing to buy property up in Washington State to carry on with his research, revive his uh, defunct UFO magazine, and so forth, but he had severe, obvious stitching in his penis. He had had a severe infection years before. His wife told me the story. Mm -hmm and which they had to literally cut it open from one end to the other in order to clean out the infection and then sew it up. And none of that was present? According to the autopsy, none mm -hmm. of that was present. But the further thing was, everybody you know, had seen the stitches that ever saw him naked, uh, either in a shower or otherwise. Now, I'd seen him naked once, but uh, I didn't take a close look. <laughs> and uh, it just didn't happen to show, that's all. Yeah. Uh, he was not in a position where it would, so I'd never noticed it. Mm. But uh, so his, did his wife actually think that was not the body of Phil Schneider? She raised a severe and a serious question that possibly it was not Phil Schneider. Uh -huh. But now it probably was though. Well, she never was allowed to see the body. Uh, really? She is questioned. Is this Phil Schneider? She wanted to see the body. They would not allow her to see the body. Why? No reason was ever given. Just know you can't see it. You can't see it. Period. Now other friends of his in the uh, Bigfoot so Club and and his brother. Did anybody see the body? Oh, yes, his brother did, and other people who knew him well, and they all his said... His brother saw the body, but his wife couldn't. Yes. That's interesting, isn't it? That's very interesting, yeah. And they all said, other than his wife, that yes, that was the body of Phil Schneider. Hmm. 
So being it was declared suicide, even though it was obviously not, the coroner said it was suicide. That is the doctor appointed as coroner. And that was the official version. Now, did did you suicide. fly up there uh, for his funeral? No, I was not there for his funeral. I came up a little after it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met some of the people in the club. I met his ex-wife for the first time. And uh, I was asked to come up fluidly to go through his personal effects in the apartment. So I did, and a friend from Seattle, I'll use the first name, Mark, and uh, I noticed something rather strange. He had a four-drawer filing cabinet, a standard office variety. It was totally empty except for perhaps two inches of papers in the middle of one of the drawers in which I looked at it. It was nothing but the receipts and filing papers for a business which he attempted to run as a consulting engineer of some kind some years prior. So who cleaned his file cabinets? That's a very good question. Who cleaned out the filing cabinet? What about his brother or wife? Did they go through it no, before? No, his wife said absolutely not. She didn't go through anything. His brother said nothing about going through anything. So how did you get access to his uh, because apartment? Uh, his wife asked me to because I was known to her. Mm -hmm. He had discussed me many times with his wife. Mm -hmm. His wife had a strange view of Phil in that she considered him as somewhat overly paranoid. And when he uh, was under extreme stress for many of the various things he was involved with, including some of these, as the way she put it, supposed car accidents, of which uh, there were quite a number. These were the attempts on his life. The attempts right? on his life. She said he'd go into a strange mode of withdrawal and uh, invent these stories. Uh, she did not believe half of what he had to tell her. Now, that, I'm stating it as I know it, and as sure. she stated it to me. But it was obvious that he was dead, and she took me to the apartment and wanted me to go through everything that was there. Now, one other thing I went through was his photo album, because I was interested in seeing the photos, which he said there were many photos in the album of his father and my father together on fishing trips. Gone. Gone. Pictures of him as a kid, gone. gone. So everything was gone, basically. Everything right. was gone except the pictures of his father and wife. Yeah. Uh, as a normal human being. As normal human and beings at an older age. And wasn't there a lot of money missing? Yes. He had sold just oh, approximately three months prior to his uh, demise his gem collection. Mm -hmm. uh, he had quite a collection of gems, uh, valuable gems as well as a rock collection. The rock collection was still in the apartment. He told me on the phone that he had sold his gem collection for some 90000 bucks, mm. which was a lot of money. Yeah. And I know what he wanted the money for. He was going up first to Idaho, and I went with him on one or two trips looking for property to buy to move up there and start up some kind of a survival thing and do his own research. He went up to uh, Seattle to meet my friend Mark up there, and he and Mark went all over Washington State, and the rumors were that he had bought property up in Washington State someplace, but that never turned up. There was no deeds, no title, nothing could be found anywhere in any of the searches of the state records that he had bought any property. But the money was missing, some 90000 So whether he did buy property or not, we do not know to this day, and whether the money was just absconded, we assume probably it was, but we don't know. Now there's some other interesting aspects as to what disappeared. He was known to have a safety deposit box. It was common knowledge among his friends. He mentioned it to me many times. He mentioned what he had in him, among other things. And that was a collection of gold bars. And I said, gold bars? He says, where'd you get them? He says, from my father. I says, did you ever see any no, of these gold bars? I never saw them, but a number of friends in the uh, Bigfoot Club did see them, and I talked to them about them. I said, did you ever see these gold bars? He says, oh, yes. He showed them to us many times. He brought them out of his vault, brought them down here, showed them to us. They all had the death's head. Uh, stamped in the bar. And the, the, death, death. the death's head. Yes, this was the symbol for the run, uh, German submarine service. Mm -hmm. They were all commanders, captains that is, of the German subservice had to carry a certain amount of gold bullion with them. That was law required in Germany. In case they got stuck someplace and had to buy their way out, they could always buy their way out with gold if they didn't have any of the local currency. So they all had the gold bullion, and when he left the subservice, somehow he managed to capture this gold and bring some of it with him, which he used to show to Phil, and Phil was going to melt it down into coinage. I do not know if he ever did or not, but uh, I never saw the gold, but he had the safety deposit box. Who knows what else might have been well, in the did, box. Did his wife open the box? Did she the box just plain disappeared. Nobody knew where it was. She didn't know where it was. Uh -huh. 
Nobody knew except Phil. So where Phil, it Phil was a very secretive guy, wasn't a he? Very secretive. Yeah. He also had and a... That perhaps uh, contributed to his demise, didn't it? He also had, according to his words, and this is in private discussions again, mm -hmm. a lab, which he had jointly with somebody else, who was a very good engineer scientist, and they were doing some of their own private research on uh, possible time travel, teleportation, whatever. And they said this guy created what he called a miniature version of... Uh, Uh, what is a TV program that shows this rotating wheel and the film of, film of water, not 2001, no, the, uh, uh, I'll think of it in a moment. He built what was apparently a miniature version of this uh, Stargate. Mm, yeah. And I said, you had one functioning? He said, yes. I says, how did it work? She says, I don't know. The other guy knew most of the technology on that. But I says, well, so you had it operating. Was it big? No. He said it was on a tabletop. It says maybe three feet in diameter. And uh, what'd you do it? Well, he says, I thought I'd be brave and I should try and put my arm through it <laughs> and see if, if my arm was all right and where it went. He says, I put my arm through it and I nearly got sucked into it. He says, I was able to hold back. He says, uh, well, why don't you try a camera? He says, I did. I says, would you get pictures? He said, yes. He says, I'll show them to you sometime. I never saw them. Wow. Uh, this lab, and any reference to it, disappeared. Nobody else seemed to know anything about it, except whoever the second party was, and I never did learn who that was. The lab disappeared. Uh, supposedly, he had a complete machine shop somewhere. That just disappeared in the woodwork. Everything disappeared. Including his own records of medical care out of the federal office building and a federal case he was building up in Washington, uh, in uh, Seattle, in the federal courthouse there we, against someone. Well, you know, during his lectures, he shows all these rare materials or alien materials. Yes. Was all that gone as well? Oh, yes, everything. So, so we at least know from the videotapes that he did have some I had exotic them in, materials. I had them in my hands. I yeah. examined them. So, but... You go back to the apartment after the death. Ball ball, All gone. Right. His bowling ball was still there because he used to bowl once in a while. <laughs> With three fingers? Apparently. <laughs> well, if he could bowl, he might be able to... Yeah, you, could, you can do it with three fingers. Uh, I guess. Uh, he was strong enough. Um, what about all those pictures, you know, the Bikini Island atomic explosion? Were those gone or were those still there? Uh, the ones that he showed publicly were still there because mm. that was already in a public domain. See, that's why he should have gone public even more. Yeah. I said, yeah. Well, we can do that uh, Sunday morning quarterbacking here. I guess. Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Let, let's just sort of close this out. Um, I would say a lot of people probably thought he was a bit loony to some degree. That's very easy to say. It's easy. That. It's because it's easy. Right? It's easy to say that but because it, of some of the things he claimed. Right. So and and it, but even his wife, according to your testimony, at times thought he was a he little was bit making, a little bit off. A little bit off. Okay. So, but based on from your experience, and and you knew him as well as anybody knows him, how, how did you find him to be, as far as a credible person? Very sane. Very stable. Very credible. He could back up all of his statements with some kind of evidence which connected with things I knew. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything hung together. Now, the claims that he committed suicide don't hold water for another reason. His wife, of course, was totally against that idea and theory. He says, he's got an eight-year-old daughter. He loved his daughter. He came over here all the time to see her. He was save, trying to save money up for her education. They established an education fund for her. And I said he, he spent all of his spare time that he could over here seeing his daughter and, of course, seeing his ex-wife. He says, he told me, he says, uh, after we were divorced, my ex-wife and I became very good friends. But he said, before that, we never got along. Mm, happens <laughs> um, a lot, yeah. It doesn't, it happens quite a bit. So, there so was, he had a lot of reasons to live, didn't he? He had many reasons to live. But he must have known by going public that his life was in jeopardy. Well, he was told that many sure. times. So why do you think he still insisted on going public? Because he said as long as he could, he was going to keep trying to put the information out to the public that he felt things could be done in a better way to, than uh, they were being done, as of course you can hear him say himself in his mm -hmm. lectures. Mm -hmm. 
and that all of this cover up and hiding was totally unnecessary and was wrong, which is sooner or later our hand, meaning the government's hand, is going to be forced into admissions under conditions and circumstances which will not be pleasant right. or desirable. So I guess just in conclusion, given the way he died and given the fact that hardly anything is preserved of Phil Schneider except for these videotapes, really, right. that's it, and a few of the pictures that you have, yeah. probably his cause will not be served as a result of his work. But it's hard to say. Hard, hard to say, but maybe as a result of what you have to no. say and some of his videos. I might say here as part of this record that, of course, other people have become interested in his history. Mm -hmm. And there is a book now published entitled The Philadelphia Experiment Murder, which deals with his life and his father's life on the Philadelphia Experiment, published by Sky Books. It's a new book just released this year. Mm. And he's mentioned in it? Oh, yeah. Uh, Phil has mentioned, of course, some of the documentation of his father. Uh, they pulled in a number of other people. Uh, the inimitable Jack Pruitt, <coughs> who was station master at Montauk, actually came down to New York with his wife from uh, where he lives in New Mexico to see the lady who was doing the interviewing and, taught, and actually wrote the book. Is that uh, Sheikha? Yes, Sheikha. Sheikha... Whatever. Yeah. Oh, she's the one who wrote the book? Yes. Okay. Uh, she tried to get him to talk about the Montauk so project, she but she w he would not do it in front of his wife. Maybe he wouldn't do it at all. I'm not sure, but I but was she not. she met him? Oh, yes, she met him physically. Jack Pruitt. Jack Pruitt, the Jack Pruitt. Wow. He's still alive and well. In fact, to his credit, he was dying of cancer in Los Angeles you know, some eight years or so ago. I knew about this through his son, Glenn Pruitt, in New York, whom I know. He was in visiting with Glenn and other family members. But Glenn knew the history to some extent, but he didn't believe it. Uh, he says, you're trying to tell me that my father was the head of the Montauk Project? And I said, yes. And Preston said, yes. He says, well, if I showed you a picture of him, would you identify him if that's the man? I said, of course, bring us a picture. So Glenn did. I took one look and said, yeah, that's Jack Pruitt, the same guy as the station master. I said, a little fuller in face in that picture than one I remember him, as I remember him. Mm -hmm. Preston took one look and said, yeah, that was him. Okay. That's interesting. All right. Well, uh, Al, thank you for your time. And uh, I hope this sheds a little bit more life on the hidden mystery, really, of our friend Phil Schneider. Mr. Phil Schneider. There are many mysteries connected with his life. And I was privy to some other things, including special photos of him standing next to uh, an early U-2 and also next to the first stealth fighter. Talking about Oscar or Phil? Phil. Phil worked on the, in the Skunk Works, and he was there at the time of the construction of the uh, <coughs> famous uh, new fighter aircraft, the stealth fighter, and of course the stealth bomber. That Aurora? No, not the Aurora. Aurora. That's totally separate. You know, the regular stealth fighter and stealth bomber, the B-2 bomber is just called a stealth bomber. He was part of that program? He was part of that program, and there's a picture of him standing next to it. He showed that he picture showed me. to you? Yes, yeah, so that's yeah. gone, too. Well, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you, Al.